Well, Spence, I mean, we find ourselves in different places in this job, don't we? But here we are in Benalla. The podcast hits the road. It's like it's like antiques roadshow, but less camp. Was always marginally. Happen. We're actually we're we're into the regionals. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a bit of a special one for us, Spence, being up here at uh, at Benalla in our, uh, our lovely Salubri studio to interview two legends of motorcycling. Absolute legends, if not. Among the top 10 Australian motorsport icons in my eyes. Well, and one of the nicest human beings, and Mick Hone as well. Yeah. <laughs> so Robbie, Phyllis and Mick Hone, um, if you've had anything to do with Australian motor- motorcycling, let alone motor racing, those two uh, names come up in lights. So what we've done, we've put them in the studio with us today and just let them run to, to talk about the incredible racing and, and the magnificent camaraderie that those two have you know enjoyed over what for 30 40 oh, we'll have to ask 100 years yeah. yeah i'm really looking forward to it man um it's gonna be fantastic and robbie phyllis is is honestly i can honestly say this and i've been in the game a little while myself one of the nicest human beings i've ever met if not the funniest yeah mick hone is one of the people i've ever met me i've met mick hone before mm. mick hone actually i've said this to you before mick hone spends a lot of time uh, coming across as a gruff old bloke, but he has been a great help to me. Mm. I've bought motorbikes off him. He's mm. got me out of trouble time and time again. And Mick actually is a legend of the game and a very good friend of mine. So I'm really excited about this one. I- I'm wrapped to be on the road. Infomoto goes on the road. Spence and Snag. Yeah. Robbie Phyllis. Mick Hone. Let's get into it. Let's go. This is the InfoMoto podcast. It's horn. Well, here we are, folks. Uh, two of uh, two of the great players in the Australian motorcycling industry. Two legends in their own lunchtime. Young Mick Hone over there and Robbie Phyllis. Welcome to InfoMoto podcast number five, six, seven. Two legends. Great to have you aboard. How long since you blokes have been knocking around together? When did you last see each other? Is, is there still love? Yeah, of course. We talk to one another on the phone more than we see each other because I'm 300 k's away. Right, okay. Um, but even when... Do you I, miss each other at all? Well... Did you shake your head there, Mick? Or? I'm just nervous. It's an audio. I'm just a bit nervous. It's, it's yeah, funny. Okay. Like He's like a bit like my best mate, my father, my financial advisor and ass kicker. <laughs> so and it's been like that for forty something years. Is it still you know? the same? Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Well, Mick, you were a racer back when you met this bloke. What what happened? He was just quicker than you, and get, decided to give it away. Or I wouldn't put it in those terms, Greg. Well, that's you know, I'm that's so, your opinion. That's just I've um, heard it around the traps. No, most, but most people uh, were quicker I, I, than you. I would, tried to be a racer, and um, you were an A grade racer. Don't, yeah, I had don't, good, you I had good, good fun, and I tried hard. You were a good racer. There were blokes that that were just different, and. Um, Faster. Robbie wasn't one of them, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I had a group of uh, mates, was um, John Harvey and Alan Pickering, and um, we used to run the superbike, and I was just getting a bit busy at work, busy at home, um, just couldn't devote the time to be a rider and do it all. I just found it was not possible. Too much. So we looked around, I said, well, you know, we should um, get a rider. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. And um, we chose Goose, Graham Muir. Yes. And uh, I thought about Robbie and I thought about Goose. and So Robbie was a bit of an up-and-comer at that point? No, he was a gun. Right, okay. Like, uh, the best place to watch motorbike racing is bit loose. on the track. Yes. Because you can see how fast they go, you know, if they're faster than you or they're not, and um, you can see them for a few laps instead of just from one corner watch them go past where yes. everybody looks fast. So, you know, a Goose, was, Goose was good and Robbie was good. And uh, they were both young Victorians, which I wanted to involve a Victorian in the team. Uh, the reason we didn't cho- choose Robbie was because... Um, well, he wasn't a Victorian, was he? Ro- he was a Wagga Wagga boy, No, no, he? I was living in Albury. I was born uh, in Wagga. Okay. Yeah, he used to go across the is river. Is Albury on, they, on our side? No, he yeah. used to cross the river to Wodonga. Albury so Wodonga Victorian. Club is actually Victorian affiliated. Right, okay. I've been... I just want to clear I've that I've been up. in that club since 1974. I'm a life member. Right, okay. Sorry, go on. So yeah. anyway, we uh, we decided on Goose because he w- he was presentable and um, fast, and Robbie was uh, fast, loose, and a bit of a crazy guy. 
Mm. So we spoke about this on a weekend that we went somewhere with Alan and uh, John and uh, decided on Goose. So I rang Goose up. I said, Goose, I'm um, looking for a rider and um, you know, I'd like to talk to you about it. And to Goose's credit, um, in those days, you know, everyone who raced, we're all mates. Yeah. And and although I was older than these guys, you know, we were still on the track together and yep. hung out and all Knocking that sort of around. stuff. Yep. And um, Goose said, look, i, I got a ride next year. I'm okay. He said, um, if you're looking for a rider, he said, you couldn't do any better than get Robbie Phyllis. Which I thought, geez, I have <laughs> seen Phyllis, you know, perform yes. uh, after the races and pubs and stuff. Yes. So anyway, we decided to give him a, a chance. Um, and he was rough around the edges. Yes. So but nothing uh, changed. You know, he, he could ride a motorbike. Could ride a motorbike. And he listened and he learned. Yes. Not that uh, I think we all grew together. Yes. But we had really good mentors in Alan and um, John and uh, later on Dragman. And basically, we all were on the same page. We all wanted to achieve success, just win races and do stuff without too much reading too much into it. And, you know, Robbie could ride the motorcycle. And the more he rode for us, the more we realised. He's a special guy. Yep. And that inspired all of us to do the part that we did better yep. and contribute. So, you know, I look at it as a holistic thing that, you know, we had a combination of everything um, that was successful. And we, we triumphed against people that had better equipment, um, higher, pay, higher paid riders, mm. more mechanics, more apparel, more everything. And we just had a good tight unit and, and it worked. Yep. You know, we had a great time. And how many – you couldn't have possibly known at that time how long that association was going to go. I mean, it's still going 60 years later. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, um, we we just do a year, mm. see what happens, and then another year, and then it just, just got legs. And um, So this know, was all under the auspices of Mick Hone Motorcycles? Yeah. yeah well, I mean, I had the bike and I had the shop and I, and I had some, you know, um, means and we attracted some, but in those days, you know uh, – it was hard to get any money. Mm. You could get some product and support. And, mm. you know, we ran a, a good ship and people supported us. Um, not great. It wasn't, wasn't a money-making proposition, but we wanted to go racing. And, mm. and, and we did it with help from, you know, people. How did it fit? Does that sound about right to you? Yeah, yeah sure. as, as a young bloke learning to ride or, you know, a semi-established fast rider, you must have been glad to get that ride. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, like I, I was with Malvern Motorcycles the, the year before in 1980 and in 78 I was with Malvern Motorcycles and and uh, with Colin O'Neill and uh, he did a good job but you know like it was, I think he spent too much money on racing and, and sent his business down the tube you know which mm. was unfortunate and because mm. uh, he's a good guy you know like and I had good guys like um, uh, doing the bikes and stuff and it was fun you know but they were, we, we, we sort of partied a fair bit yeah, but like I've never, when I say party, I've never done drugs of any description. I don't it, reckon you need to, Robbie. Uh, and you know, I've never smoked a, a, a thing in my life. I've never, mm. t never tried it, you know. So, and I'm scared of needles. Yeah. Um. So I've never, I've always been against drugs. Um. I did, I did start drinking when I was turned twenty one, but um, I don't I haven't had a drink for fourteen or sixteen years or something now. Mm. Um, and uh, I don't miss it one bit, you know. So, like, I was uh, pretty high on my own bloody steam, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I think I might have a <laughs> um, was it ADD? I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, I think there's a rough there's a rough chance. There's a good chance, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think my sisters might be a bit the same. But anyway, um, so back to um, yeah. you, So you you team up with Mick Hone. Um, what bike are we on at this point? Well, there was a GS thousand that Mick had. Is that that same black one? No, uh, no, the GS thousand, the two the, valve the, engine, the two valve. Ah, right, okay, yeah. Because he was building the four valve. Yeah. And then um, we in at the end of eighty, we did um, the Coca Cola eight hundred. That was the first race. Did you qualify pole, or did we qualify second, or something like that? To Dennis Neal. Uh, I can't remember. 1980. 1980. 42 years of, ago. It was the end of 1980. Yeah. They had that Coca-Cola 800 dollar in park. Yeah. And then um, we were leading it and the friggin' thing started running on three cylinders. Stopped, couldn't work it out. 
this circlip fell off the needle. <laughs> yeah. And put us out of the race, yeah. basically. Yeah, that can happen. And um, it was just one of those things, you know, like the bike would have gone the whole distance, like, because it was a good bike, you know, it was, it was easy to ride. It was pretty fast, you know, like um, handled good. So you two are working together. Like how many weekends a year are you out racing at that point? Oh, I in reckon a, we in would 81 it, um, was probably dozen races? as good a year as we had and that was the year that Alan built the black GSX 1100. Yes. And we had some Yoshi bits in it, some other bits in it, some suspension we got here and there, you know, but it was a good bike. Um, and Still it got went it. well, and it, and it was a good bike to ride. Yep. So uh, I think that year, eighty one, eighty yeah. one. Well, you yeah. won the championship. Didn't yeah. You? yeah, but we won the NGK Superbike Series. The was it the Can Am or was it the Can Am? I think Can Am or or, or, or in Swan Insurance. No, Can Am. Um, no, no, we did look. We did um, twenty one races for the year. It's a lot, isn't it? Yep, on the Superbike, and we won nineteen. Strike. So. It was – we got into that mindset that we expected to win. Yes. We didn't expect to, uh, you know, to come second. We just knew we had a yeah. good rider and a good bike. And um, the bike, that whole year we ran, never pulled it apart, no. never freshened it up. We just – Really? Alan never pulled it the apart. engine yeah. in his garage at Sunshine, you know, did the head, did all that stuff. We used Yoshi cams and pistons and whatever else we had. But basically we put it together, Phyllis rode it, and it did the whole year – Dominating, and we never did any maintenance. And it had top ended everything. You know, um, it, was it was a great so bike. It was it's a phenomenal year, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Nineteen of twenty one. But I won two more championships on that thing, you know. Yeah. And yeah. O, o eight and uh, o six, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. And, and it's still actually, I was talking to Spud about it two days ago. We we got the ignition out of it at the moment. The, it's a um, Dyna ignition, which is in sitting in the Katana or the XR sixty nine. But we're talking about taking it to. Um, the broadie for the Bonanza oh, just yeah, to yeah. do a few laps on it because I haven't ridden it for ages. Yeah, that'd be good. And it's, it's just a neat old thing, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a great old thing. It is. And it looks trick. Yeah, yeah. You know, it it's just, it's a tough looking thing, you know. Yeah. Like, it's I a loved great it. looking bike. Yeah. No. Um, the thing that impressed me was that that year we dominated the super bike racing and, you know, we were young and enthusiastic, all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the year, they have that uh, Swan si International Series. Yes. So, Robbie rode the super bike in that. Um, I think finished He's third, third, yeah. third in the series against all the guys that came back for Europe on their five hundreds and seven fifties, like, like whom? Gardner, McKel McElnay, um, Stuart Vaughan. I mean, there's a lot of guys used to come back, you know, ride the Grand Prix bikes in the Australian summer as a test for because it was snowing everywhere else in the world. So yeah. ah, it was a great yeah. opportunity. The Swan Series attracted a lot of international guys for a bit of a remedial riding and you know a tune up for the coming season His yeah. so you know it was fantastic so result some, some, yeah. on that some bike. good riders yeah. yeah yeah um so you know that sort of escalated what our expectations yes um and you know the super bike racing we just ran a really tight ship yes uh had we did everything to the best of our ability and we're all on the same page and everybody's ego was in control and we were like a unit that together uh, as a team the result was important yes. and it wasn't me doing this or Robbie doing that. We all contributed and it and the sum of it was success. Well, yeah. it sort of has to be like yeah. that for it to like work. Like I was I was laying carpet at home in Albury. Yeah, you know, like just working normal normal yes. normal job and um I never got paid or anything like that. But that year all the all the prize money went to the sponsor, right? To the to the um the entrant, which is I, Mick. I, I think I just told you that, Robbie. Because I knew if you got the money... I'd spend it. You'd spend <laughs> it. So I did a deal with all the people that when the prize money was being paid, it got paid to me. Fis and I kept it in the bank account. account. The ANZ Bank in Box Hill kept that, that money, yes, right? Yes, yes. And it was $14,750 yeah. at the end of the year. It's a good quid. Yeah. Well, in 1980, that's a... Fair amount of money, yeah. especially first, my racing first in house, Australia. Absolutely, my, I put a deposit on my first house, which was twenty nine thousand dollars. Yeah, you know. So like, not only was it an enterprise that you obviously clearly enjoyed in the labour of love, there was there was fiscal payback. If you, the racing scale of prize money was 
good if you won and dropped off pretty quickly. Yes. So I think if the, you win, you got good money. If you finish second, it was you know. We yeah, had yeah, we had that strong. meeting at Canberra on that on that Macarthur Park on the on that street circuit, and uh, I won won everything there that weekend. It was nineteen hundred dollars cash. Mm. You know, like that's not bad. That's not a bad earn for the for a weekend. Yeah. Back in nineteen eighty one. No. I can remember all these figures because I've always been hard on a dollar. Yeah. Tight as the fish is. Because I I remember at that Bathurst weekend when when I rode for Hon- the Honda, but Mick organised the deal. We had the RG five hundred and and then um, I took forty three hundred dollars home. Well, that's a lot of money, isn't it? For two riding two bikes, and won the RI five hundred. I think I led every lap too, didn't I? Nearly. Bar the first one, was it? Yeah. Actually, yeah. it's going to make us jump around a bit, but I wanted to talk to you about that. Uh, Bathurst. Talk, talk yeah, me well, through. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later uh, if you want. We'll well, I don't want to be here all night, Robbie, but yeah. uh, Bathurst. Well, tell me about, was it, were you scared at Bathurst? Yes, of course I was. Yeah. That's why I didn't ride very hard there. Yeah. It, wasn't everyone scared at Bathurst? No. There's one nutcase that uh, did the job and had the lap record and still probably has got it, you know, but, but like, I was never willing to die to win. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like that's the difference. I, I've always had respect. I've had a lot of crashes. I've broken a lot of bones, forty nine bones, smashed, a um, few brain hemorrhages, and uh, you know, like, but if I could do it all again, I would. But at the same time, like Bathurst, uh, the Cemetery Circuit, um, the other track at. Uh, in uh, Wellington at uh, Gracefield, um, a couple of tracks in Europe I rode on were, were road street circuits, and I've had a pet hate against them because of um, the dangers involved. When motorcycle racing is dangerous enough, mm. when you've got as much runoff area as you can have, mm. so you don't hit anything, because that's what does all the damage when you hit things. And then it's like the Isle of Man. Like I, I can't believe they still do that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like how many people has it killed? Yeah, and a few of my friends yes. and Tom Phyllis. So, you know? what's your position on the Isle of Man? Like, was you must have been offered plenty of rides there? I got offered in 1990 by old mate. I can't remember his name. It used to. I think, I think he might have passed away. He used to organise the the riders, pay the riders. He offered me twenty one thousand pound to ride there in what 1990. Year? 1990. Oof, this is at Donington. We were at the World Supers there. And I said, if you put a hundred thousand in front of that, I still wouldn't go. Is that right? He said, really, you don't have to ride around. I said, I don't care. If I go to race, I want to win. I don't. I'm not going there to ride around. Mm. And it's that's that's the way life is, you know. Like it's always been the same. I've always put in as much as I can. I tried as hard as I could to win a race. And if I didn't win, I still trying as hard as I could. Yeah. You know, like, that's a lot of money to knock back, though, Robbie. It was probably um, a quarter of. Um, but you're at what I got paid to ride by Kawasaki mm. for for no, for, to, to the, for 1990 World Championship. Yeah. But, you know, like money, money's – it's a hard one with me. Like I've never had any. Um, but I always – when there was good prize money, I always put my neck on the chopping block a fair bit, you know, mm. like at, at safer circuits. But mm. having said that, safer circuits in Australia – Show me a, a safe circuit in Australia. Mm. Well, I can now. I haven't been to to, um, to South Australia to that. I haven't seen that track yet. And neither have I. To Bend. To Bend, yeah. I haven't either. But, um, you know, like, Phillip Island's pretty good except for Hayshed. Yeah, and, well, and, and Turn 1. You recently did a job on yourself at, well, how long ago? Five years ago now? Uh, I, yeah, yeah that's, that was a... The last race I had, I've had a few crashes at Phillip Island. Probably, I don't think I, I don't think I crashed on turn one, but I've crashed on just about or turn three. I've crashed on every other corner though. Um, Hayshed's got me a few times. Yeah, the last one was pretty large too. Yeah, that one was over over Lukey, and I think my brake got lever. Oh, got, was that, I thought it was Hayshed. No, that was Lu- over Lukey with with Dibsy. Yeah, we both finished up in hospital out unconscious. Yeah, you rang your bell and yeah, and I spleen or something. Oh uh, no, a couple of vertebrae, um, a rotator cuff, a brain hemorrhage. Um, bell. Yeah, brain hemorrhage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that you know, um, 
that was enough. And, I and woke up and I woke up in hospital with my son, my special needs son Tom, at the end of the bed. Mm. <sighs> um, sorry. No, it's all right. And so that was enough. Yeah. 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 No, it's, a, it's a fair call. I mean, you gave it a fair old. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> he, he old needs he needs me more than you know, does. like because he's he's full time care for life. Yep. And he gotcha. won't. He hasn't got me for much longer, really. You know, like I'm 60, 66 next month. You know, like and yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, that's a very admirable thing that you've just said. I'd like to have another go, but you know, like you never say never. But the problem is, I want to win. And the yeah. throttle only works one way, you know. Like it's, yeah. and then, and then, and if you if you can't win, why do it? Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on that, Mick? I mean, you 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 were working with Rob back. Let's go back to where you were winning championships and you know winning nineteen out of twenty one races and that sort of thing. You must have known, you know, yeah, Rob's at risk. You know. Well, I don't know that I've ever met a bigger wimp. <laughs> I hate, he I hate pain. He's a bit of a sore. I, I hate he hates pain. pain <laughs> right? So I could never understand how a guy could go so fast and then be worried about getting a splinter in his finger and how much it hurt. And, and you know, I mean, Robbie is a, a knockabout, you know, good fun, extremely honest, extremely nice guy. That's a bit crazy. Right? Yes. But yes. on a motorcycle, he was a maestro. Yes. It, just something about what he did on the bike, it was like really good music. Yes. And when I raced against him, I mean, I could see he was doing things that just it worked. Mm. And then when he raced for me and I was on the track with him at the same time, you know, there were things that he did just go, wow, like, you know, he just goes so fast into that corner. Mm. And, um, I mean, I could appreciate that. I mean, a lot of guys that raced were really good, but then there were people that were better than that. Yes. And, you know, in Australia we've been very lucky – that over the years we have some great riders that are, you know, as good as you can get in the world. Yes. And and I was very privileged when I raced a race against um, Cros, Greg Hansford, um, guys that were just, you know, really, really great mm. riders. And, and Robbie was like that. So, you know, what I found was that he hadn't um, – he thought he was racing, but his potential was always more. Mm. And one example was at um, Sandown in a Swan Series thing – we had a, a, the Suzuki Katana Superbike, and Robbie yeah, rode and around. Robbie rode around in the um, Superbike race and did you know minute thirteen or something, which was the Superbike time and really fast and all that sort of stuff. And then in the Swan race, where he was up against the guys on their RG five hundreds and CZ seven fifties, he went four seconds a lap faster, mm. and, and just because the lure was there. Mm. So you could see that you know he could win the Superbike race with a bit in hand, mm. with some margin, and that's probably was the secret to the fact he stayed on the bike so often was that he was never pushed beyond its limit or his limit. Mm. I remember that weekend because we had the RGB there and it seized down into the first turn and I finished up pinned between it and the Armco in turn one mm. and it really hurt. You know, like I was, <laughs> it was really so anyway, we took the RG home and, and locked it in the garage and said, well, you're not riding it. Get him, keep him away so from So he that. rode the superbike in the Swan race and I, went... I couldn't. And I could hardly walk. Yeah, I can remember because getting my leg over the over the seat was a was a nightmare. Because <laughs> you know, like I got it in the crutch and all sorts of places. You know, like where it pinned me against the armco. I thought of, I thought I was going to die. Yeah, you know, but didn't. <laughs> you know, and no, you clearly and, didn't. And you know, like I look at, I look at Wally Campbell. He could crash three times in a weekend. And hurt himself, and get back out there within one lap. He's still doing the doing the lap record yeah. times. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, it's not mortal. You know, yeah. like unbelievable. We mere mortals don't understand what you guys do. Yeah. You know, it's it's some some magic. I don't know. You know, like to beat him. You know, like you. Yeah, it was a pretty big thing. Mm. So all right, so you have you have the success. You're with Mick. Where are we now? So we bring you up to the mid '80s. Where are we there? What, what's the relationship? What are you doing? Well, we're still doing the Superbike series. 
because they didn't wouldn't make it a championship, even though it was the biggest thing in in Australia. You know, like well, uh, we were talking about that in the pub, weren't we? There was yeah, you know, there's like, plenty of people wanted to go. And yeah, it was ten thousand people at friggin' Winton, you know, like watching Superbox. You know, yeah, like it was it was, it was big, and the, there was fields of oh, I suppose twenty to thirty bikes, mm. and like any, everyone could like how much does that black bike cost to build? About five grand. Uh, probably, yep. You know, like. Well, I think superbike racing in those days, you you had to buy a bike in Australia that's a normal bike, mm. and then you could make it into a superbike. Yes, it was only later on that they started bringing in factory bits and ra- they, they, they. I remember the Yamaha um, dealer team; they had radiators on their bike that cost more than most other people's bikes. Yeah, and swinging arms that cost you know an arm yeah. and a leg, and you go, well, that's not the idea of superbike racing: mm. is get a bike, make it work, ride it, and you can be successful. Yeah, so. I think superbike racing lost its way a bit yes. um, when the factories got involved and they changed the rules and there was all this stuff you could change. Whereas the early days on the superbike, you had to buy the bike, you could change the wheels, you could change the um, engine, you could do some you know bits and pieces. But basically, standard it had brakes, to be a standard bike. Standard and front end on the same um, on the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that would have precluded a lot of people that were sort of running on a tight budget. Yeah. Or, you know, okay, anyway, your weekend warrior yeah, kind yeah, of guy. That's exactly well, right. What I saw happening in the early days, we'd go to Winton or we'd go to Sandown or wherever we were racing, and honestly, I'd look at the front row and the second row and I'd say, gee, there's probably a dozen blokes here. Wouldn't surprise me if they won. Yeah. Greg Pretty was riding the Yamaha XS 1100, Dennis Neal. There's lots of guys, and they, it was a really exciting period to be in. Yes. And there was a, quite a variety of bikes and different ideas and different products, and it was really healthy. Then, um, you know, as I saw it develop and it got more and more specialised, then the guys on the, the distributor back bikes, whether you call them factory bikes or distributor bikes, mm. the gap became that great. Yeah. That if you weren't with them, you were that much slower. Mm. It was embarrassing for you to say, I'm going to go and race, and they lap you, you know. Yeah. You just fall off the pace. You can't stay with them. And mm. that, that, to me, was the big difference. Kind of regardless how much talent you've got. Well, you, you can't just on a bike... The rider input is very important, mm. but if you're outgunned, I mean that's it. You're that's outgunned. it. Yeah. You know, you can ride really hard it's, and still be three seconds. See, slower. in the early '80s, Dennis Neal was the man to, that that was sort of doing the job. You know, like, um, and Nev Hiscock and and Dave a little bit as well. And uh, there's a few there's a few guys around. And Johnny Pace. I'm trying to think of Greg Pretty. Um, of all the guys that were. Andrew past. Johnson. Um, oh, AJ, yeah. Um, who else was there? Yeah, you know, like, there's just privateers. Well, I mean, Jimmy Budd was riding a Kawasaki. Yeah. You know, there's like lots of guys. Jeff Thine and um, um, Mark, Scott Stevens. Scotty Stevens, Mark, Mark Lithgow, you know, like, they were all good, mm. you know, like, and but just <laughs> doing it doing it the hard way, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, yeah so when – good. So the – if we get up sort of to the late 80s, when did you sort of get um, uh, overtures from overseas for... No, we'll see what happened in 80... World Supers and stuff. 86 was the last year I, I, I had with Mick because it was starting to get to the point where other people were getting paid money and Suzuki weren't that keen mm. to pay anyone any money and Mick couldn't afford it. Mm. But... Neville Doyle offered me. I already had a deal with Neville in '84 to ride production, mm. and that was good because I got thirteen thousand mm. dollars. But I got an extra three. It was ten thousand dollars to start with, and then another three just to go to Bathurst. So I didn't want to go there. Mm. That was um, on the safety ba- basis. Yeah, yeah. But um, so we go there, and you know that was okay. And then eighty, eighty seven. Kawasaki wanted to go superbike racing. They were already superbike racing with their 900, mm. but then they had the GPZ, GPX mm. 750, and uh, they offered me a, a ride. And I talked to Mick and said, Well, what do you think? And like they paid me 25 grand, I think it was. Well, it's either that or nothing. Yeah. I, no, no, I, I didn't look at it that way. I, I looked at it that I was very um, was happy hard. and proud to be a stepping stone. Mm. Okay, and, you know, if I could help develop Robbie from a wild child into a guy that could ride a motorcycle and fit into a team and have success 
more than in Australia, um, I, I felt I'd done my job. Mm. I was happy to be part of it and I didn't want to, you know, if he was going to go to Kawasaki and go World Superbike, I, c- I couldn't do that from one shop in Melbourne. No. no. And although I wish we'd have done that jump, uh, we didn't, so... You know, yeah, would've, uh, we could have well, killed the shop. Superbike started, you know, uh, around there, and we could have been in it, and I'm sure we could have been competitive, but we really didn't have our act together internationally that way. Mm. So, you know, probably would have been a step underfunded. above where you could have yeah, done so it. Yeah. So, yeah. I was happy to see Robert go to a good team and have a chance to be competitive in World Super. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, I was always happy and supporting. So, you had that su- success with the GPX locally in '88. Uh, I got that success once we got radial tyres. Yeah. You know, okay. And, so and how does that, that point up to be in World Supers in 1990? Well, see, the Kawasaki factory were, were doing their um, F1 bike and they were testing that. So part of the deal was for me to go and ride in Japan with Kawasaki as well. Okay. You know, like and do a bit of test work for the factory on yep. the F1 bike. And um, so. I go off over there and I actually didn't do too bad. I I was always in front of the rest of the Kawasaki guys and uh, but the bike was never as good as that Honda or or yeah, you know, the Honda had it, you know, like and mm. but the RC thirty was a better bike than that mm. that oh. G, GPX around that Just track because it was so day. fast. Yeah. I'd never been there before. That was the the second time I'd been to Europe. First time was to ride mixed bike in Misano. Which I'd rather talk about that. Yes. Because yes. we built a GSX R750 in 85 um, to race Australian superbikes. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the year, we ran that 85. GSX-R. Yeah. That's a G, a G or H? F, F. F. First model F. GSX-R. Jesus, yeah. So we were lucky enough to get one of them to race as a superbike and um, Picky weaved his magic on it. Yep. We ran the Australian superbikes and... Uh, very competitive. Then we ran in the Swan Series at the end of the year against all the GP bikes. And Roberto Galina was here uh, with Killy. I don't know. He had yeah, a couple of RG500s, factory bikes. Frankie, yeah. And, and, and we're at Calder and um, Phyllis outbraked them down the back straight. And then I didn't know Roberto Galina at that stage. And he, he came walking around. I knew who he was to look at, but I'd never met him. And he came up and he's just looking at our bike. Just looking at it. And it's standard a, it's front a GSX-R, wheel, it? standard front wheel, and brakes. standard brakes, standard forks. And he's it, looking at it. Is that how you're doing this? And he's looking at it and he goes, I do not believe it. And, I said, <laughs> and he said, how, how does he outbreak the factory bikes in the back? Mm. You know, and they've got like everything on them. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I don't know. We just, you know, that's, that's what he does. So That's Robbie. Anyway, Roberto invited us to go over and run the first round of the World Formula One Bike Championship at Mazzano, which um, we thought a great opportunity. We funded it ourselves. 200 mile race. Ah, uh, yeah. We funded it ourselves. Yeah. Um, packed the bike up, shipped it over there, uh, flew over there, did the race, which was the first round of the World Formula One Championship, which you know um, was good. We were lucky enough to finish third. Like, um, like made mincemeat of the Suzuki um, works bikes. Like, they weren't even in the top ten. Mm. And I remember uh, Marco Lucinelli won it on a factory Ducati. Uh, Anders Anderson on a factory Suzuki was second. And Rob was third on yeah. a pretty stock-looking bike. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that that was a great result. And they said, oh, you're going to come to whatever. And I said, no, we're going home. Like, they've just came to do one race. Yeah, the carnival's over. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it would be great if we're in a position to keep going. Yeah. Well, you clearly were... They, people would have been noticing that. Well, the prize money I won at that race paid for the ship shipping of the bike back to Australia. The oh, deal, the oh. deal we had was I I paid to get it then. Robbie paid to get it back. Yep. What yep. I didn't know, and he didn't know, is that there's no uh, no freight going from Australia to Italy, so it's cheap. But there's lots of freight coming back, so it was four times the price to get it back. Uh, so oh, you know that's on. how it worked out. But, but shit happens, you know. Like it was yeah, but we had a we had a great had a, time. Had a, had a, had we we met time. some people. A great well, result. I rode Galena's five hundred around there on for practice because my bike was still in customs, and um, we we're trying to get it. I was frightened I wasn't going to get the bike for the race. Oh, right, and okay. and I was riding around there on his on his RGB, which um, I took there for him because he sold it to um, a German guy. Um, Oh, I know his name. I can't remember. Anyhow, um, 
Bruno somebody it was. Um, and um, I rode that thing to learn the circuit. And Rob McElnay was there with Ago, and I think um, Dave Peterson might have been there too. Uh, no, maybe not Dave, I don't know. But it, the lap times I was doing on it, and I never had tyres or anything like that, like Rob got pole position in the five in the 500 race. Like if I'd have ridden that bike that weekend, I would have given them a run for their money. Mm. You know, like yeah, yeah. You know, but it didn't happen. But anyway, but, that was. But that we're was working. We we found out we, the tank wasn't big enough. Okay. Because it only held thirteen or something liters. So I've got this brainwave, and galena has got his 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 bus with the awning on it, right? And I thought, if I can make the tank bigger, we can get get more laps. You know, I don't have to make one pit stop. So you got to blow the tank. No. There's a big dent in the tank where the where the airbox goes, right? Yeah. But we didn't have an airbox, so I just Bang got a out. I just got a flat plate steel that Galena had in the, in the back of his bus. Put the tank in the, on the exhaust pipe of his car, blew all the all the all the gas out of all the all the vapors, you know, yeah. and then um, welded a piece in, drilled holes in the in the in the dome that was in the bottom of the tank. And then started bronzing, oh no, bronzing or no? I think I was, I don't can't remember if I was bronzing or not. But Kel Carruthers walks in, right? Because he's with with Ago's team and Rob Mack, and he had never met me before. And he goes, "Hey, Robbie, you know, like," and I, I've just lost the bundle, you know, like, "Oh fucking hell, he's he's a <laughs> I'm legend." Sprung. I'm sprung. He's a legend, you know. Yeah, he's yeah. got all his Marlboro gear on. And he comes into Galena's Galena's tent, and he's watching me weld this fucking. Tank up, right? <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, you know, I said, I oh, just, the tank's not big enough. So two hours later, we're still talking to one another. He's got the hammer tapping, tapping the, um, while I'm welding. And the legend. Yeah. And, he, and it was just, that was the first and only time I've ever met him. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, that, that was what it was like. We were Australians. Yeah. And, and people, um, I remember Cathcart came to interview Robbie. And Galena had these two giant buses. One was a hospitality and one was a workshop. And we had a van parked around the back. With a caravan. Hidden, hidden around the back. And Cathcart's looking for us amongst all the buses. And there we are, minnows at the back. <laughs> but, you know, he was good. Um, yeah, but yeah. Cal, Cal came looking yeah, for us because yeah. we were Australians and we were there. And, yeah. you know, I suppose that's what it's like when you go overseas. You know, I'll never forget Cathcart. Like I'm standing there talking to him in the, in the paddock and there's two Italian boys walking past holding hands and kissing one another right yeah. and i go check this out and he looks around and then he looked back at me and it was like strange he said oh don't knock it until you've tried it <laughs> <laughs> i'll never forget that and i never i never I, every time i see him I always yeah, bring it up him, I always remind him of it <laughs> well that that is a perfect chance for us to have a little break yeah because i need a pee oh, i need a pee too I'll, um, I'll race you but hang on we're just getting to the good stuff so we'll be back in a couple of minutes yeah right just for a bit of light. Oh, the trail bikes. Now, Robbie's, uh, now, Rob, I Robbie's was a, excellent adventure. Robbie's e excellent adventure. As I, you guys called it. That's exactly what we called it. I was a cub reporter, Mick, believe it or not, back then. Gee. Young and... and uh, It was 95, it was. 95. It was, 1995. What's that? It 20, was two weeks before Aaron Slides. 27, 27 years. I started in motorbike journalism in 94, so it was 95. So one of the fir my first job, first job was interviewing you, which was fucking harrowing, I must admit, because you, you have spent a long time trying not to let people know what a nice bloke you are. Greg, um... Uh, look, I don't want to crush your ego, but I can't remember that at all. I remember. Nothing well, that's what I mean. I walked in. Anyway, uh, Robbie rings up. Uh, the first time I spoke to you, I was working for AMCN. It was a KR250, remember? I was yeah, doing a story on KRs. 80, 80, 84. You raced one. Yeah. So I rang you up. Anyway, you were your usual f friendly self and helpful. You know, I mean that. You were nice to me. Oh. So then <laughs> a, about a year later, Robbie rings up AMCN and says, look, I... I've got this idea. And he says, because he's always going to make some money, you know, he's got a few, I'm going to do the, I've got an iron in the fire and, and, and he, a popular bloke. So he said, what I want to do is run this tour company, Mick. We'll go up the, up the bush and people can come riding with me, Robbie Phyllis, and I'll take them up through the bush and they can pay some money. And before you know it, you, you know, I'm a wealthy man. Would you mind coming up and riding with a couple of your mates with me? 
So you know, dirt bikes and I have never been great friends, but we I could bullshit my way through it. So oh, up we go. There's Robbie. He's got this Fenicum. It's the oldest XR250. It was I've an ever. '89 model. It was a. It looked like it cost nineteen hundred dollars. It, it was right? going to be great when it was finished, and it felt looked like it had fallen off a truck. So here's Robbie on that thing, right, out riding all of us. Oh, he puts me on a Husqvarna one two five two stroke. You know, all all I remember is trying to climb a hill, flipping it about eight times, and him throwing rocks at me from the top, saying, "You pussy." <laughs> this is him going. He, yeah, he's, he's a nurturer. He's a nurturer. nurturer. He's bringing me along slowly. So this is the bloke that's going to be the entrepreneur. Who's and, gonna? And he's gonna host these. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine European riders coming out? They're used to riding around quiet streets in Milan. He's gonna take them on these tours. So anyway, we, I've flipped this thing about eight times. This is in the first hour, and Robbie's going. How do you reckon this is going? I'm going. Well, it's a bit hard. I broke my thumb in the first ten minutes. <laughs> That's killing me. Anyway, we get down, come down a hill, and Robbie's throwing rocks at people and swearing at people, and I'm thinking this is probably not going over as well as it could. <laughs> So we hit this raging torrent. It looked like the Colorado. So Robbie apparently had crossed it a week before and he said, this will be all right. I said, Robbie, mate, I said, Evil Knievel couldn't jump that. You, you, I said, you can't take punters through this. He said, it's all right. Don't worry about that. Look no, at that. Crocodiles get in there. What are you worried about? If I can get this NXR through there, you can get your mung and LC4. <laughs> sure enough, off he goes. He gets a metre in and eight metres down. So he's underwater. We've fished him out, it's sort of pumped him full of it. Three hours later, emptying out his XR, get to the pub at the end of the night. I've got a broken thumb. I never want to see a dirt bike again. Anyone else, that's, they're just traumatised. They're walking around with dinner plates. And he reckon it'll go snag. What do you think about my business? Well, Needless to say, the tour got, business didn't quite. Yeah, but what about the pub? How good was that? Oh, it was fantastic, and there was almost a party trick <laughs> there. But we, we didn't. Yeah, we, yeah, we didn't get to the. We party didn't. Trick. I was no. asking for the party no, trick, no, Rob. No, no. But it's but, a family show. Yeah, it was a family show. But the next day we were going to go and do the big ride, weren't we? But we, I had a broken thumb. I never yeah, had too much of a headache, and everyone had a hangover. It was well, look, something fierce. I remember it? it fondly, but I just. It yeah. was one of those business ideas that you had. Yeah. That one I of thought many that I've heard. Yeah. Many. Have you got any? That you oh. could share with us, with that, Robbie's. Well, there's the time. You know, that was two weeks before Aaron Slight's wedding, right? And that bike got stolen while I was at Aaron's wedding, which probably wasn't a bad thing. The guy crashed it and set fire to it. <laughs> well, that probably improved it from what I could have seen of it. Prick. Yeah, go on, Mick. Well, no, there was the time we were going to race at uh, Surface Paradise in the F100 with Dragman. And um, we're coming back and we had to endure. Um, just brainstorm ideas coming out of Robbie and one of them was how he reckons he could put some inflatable skirts on the side of the F100 and we could drive it across rivers. Yeah, I reckon we could do that and we could take people. Like that was just the start of it. That was the start that of it. That was just one. There's there was a couple of flaws one. in that he did business buy model. That, what was that big truck you bought? The uh, four-wheel the, drive? The old, the old um, Akko from uh, – we bought an Akko from uh, the army auctions at Bandiana. Yes. And um, it was four-wheel drive. I took I took all the Swan Boys for four-wheel driving in it up back of Wodonga. Yes. We had the cable pulled out. It's 250 foot of winch cable, as thick as your thumb, right? <laughs> it took five of us and Buster to, to carry it, drag it up the hill to the tree to because to, it was so steep. So heavy. It was so, uh, so heavy <laughs> and the hill was that steep, you know. Like, we were mowing down whole blackberry trees. <laughs> This is like this is just one of his many, many, many ideas. It was unreal. I wanted to do a tours with it. Yes, tours. Because it was a troop carrier. Yes. Those days they didn't have seat belts or anything like that. They had the tarp over the back, you know. Like yeah, slab of beer and, and away we, and, we go. And five miles of the gallon of petrol. Yeah. International echo. There's a flaw in your business model there. But yeah. unbelievable in the bush. You couldn't stop it. How did that go? Did that take off? That no, 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 <laughs> no, we drove around, it. We drove around well. it for two years, paid five grand for it at, at the Bandiana auction <laughs> and I, I, I was racing at Oran Park and I, some bloke up, up there wanted to buy it for his farm to do spreading crops and stuff and I got $7,000 for it and I drove it all the way to Sydney from Albury. A win. It would and, have cost him two and, grand in petrol. Uh, and, and I used, I used just under 400 litres of fuel. 
<laughs> and I had it flat out the whole way. Oh, no, just no. just on what, si- 50 si- miles an hour? 60 miles an hour. 60. Oh, fuck. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I love that thing, you know. Did like, you? Yeah. It was awesome. Well, then there was that other petrol, um, when you, you know, we're on the petrol making money thing. Petrol making? You tried to convince me that there was this ship in Sydney that had so many oh. thousand litres of petrol. No, diesel, diesel, diesel. diesel it had, right had 7,000, no, 7 tonne. No, I can't remember. Anyhow. It was a it was giant a, ship. It was a 50, 50 metre long ex-whaler up on the islands, the, the, the Solomon Islands, I think, where, the, where they're having that, that little war. Yeah. This is in 2000. Right. And I was trying to, I was living in Sydney and I was trying to buy a house. And everything was, you know, I did buy a house eventually, but this boat was for sale for 90 grand. Yes. And it had. That's cheap. It was. Yeah. That's why I wanted to buy it. Yeah, I, I see. Because I had. I, I did, can see it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it's starting to make sense yeah, to yeah, me. No. Well, Neil Bird wanted to go halves with me. Right. right. Okay. Anyhow, it had 20, 23 cabins. Jeez. It was a whaler, though. It had two cranes, it had a helipad. <laughs> it had. Seven thousand dollars worth of meat in the freezer, a new gen set and new air conditioning. It had, I think, seven <laughs> ton of fuel in it. Diesel. It's a bargain at that. And it had a an eight cylinder. And a, Mick, I don't man, know how we can go wrong. Why don't you want to get involved? Man, man, diesel. And it was when the Olympics were happening in two thousand, right? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, we could live on that. Alex was really excited because he thought he could ride his QR50 around it. around it, right? And if he fell off, it'd only go underwater and we'd tie a life jacket to the bike, right? So He's thought his bits. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. So, <laughs> so anyhow, then, then we were thinking, where are we going to moor it? Because it was up in the Brisbane River, which is in flood now. But um, It is too. Um, we're going to drive. So, how have you roped him on? Like you oh, said, I, I was just telling him because I was. He looking. floated the idea by me. Yeah, yeah. And it sunk think? straight it's away. Straight, so, no, and I'm telling no. Neil Bird, and then, then, then Birdie said we could, we could get a couple of barges and tie them to India and, and scrap it and sell it, sell it for scrap metal for more than that. You know, like there was a quid to then, be made. Then. And then he said, "Well, we could even do fishing trips or swingers club." Oh. He's a thinker. <laughs> that bird, that bird, he's a What about the seven tons of meat? What were you going to do with that? Oh, seven thousand dollars worth of meat. What was in the freezer? Eat it. Eat it. <laughs> he's not saying it's if, it's, if, it's, if it's camel or whale or but, you know. But they rump took it up steak. there because they were going to do tours over there, right? Yes. And then the war broke out. The Timor War or whatever it was. Oh, right. The team, East Timor. Yeah. Is that the Solomon Islands? I don't know. I don't know where I am. Mick it's in the, it's Mick, in the ocean. Mixed out geography. Somewhere up yeah. in the ocean, you know. Yeah. Like it wasn't yeah, it's up there. there. It was up there, yeah. And um, then I rang up. So what came of it? Why did you do I, it? Well, I started looking for mooring because right. I couldn't swing more. It had to be tied up to dock. Right. And the dock in Sydney uh, was $50,000. <laughs> so that's for, why they found for, you. For three months just Poor to man. moor it, right? That even with the that, even that with was, the meat, that that's was not with, that was with the uh, the Olympics happening, you know. Like right. I was, so um, that was that idea. That was, yeah, but I still would have liked to have bought it. How'd they come to you though? Like, well, I found it. I was I was flying somewhere. I had a magazine, a boats magazine. I've always like I always wanted a boat. Yes, I want a houseboat now. Yeah, I know. You've told me that, that that I can tow. Yes, you know, so I can go to the lake. I reckon you'll do that. I will. I'm yeah. gonna I think I'm gonna build it because. I get what I want then. Yeah. Without all the expense. Yep. It might sink. Oh, I have to give you it credit. Might, it might sink, but you have some know. hairbrain screens, but you always follow through. You build things, and I know you do well, do I'm, that. I'm my seventeenth Renault. Yeah, I know. And, I know. But it's what like I, I'm not because I've hurt myself so much. Like I'm good for about three hours of work a day. Yep. You know, like, and I need help from other people. Yep. And you can't pay. Everybody. Many people are help, happy you, to help you too. You cannot like pay many people. It's a problem when you don't have any money. Yeah. But, you know, like you buy a house, renovate it, sell it and spend all that that you're meant to be buying the next house with on <laughs> racing <laughs> <laughs> for your kids. You know, you do all this stuff for your kids. You, you do. Know? And you've got Tom to look after. Yep. George is pretty pretty happily married with, with Jordan and they've got a good business going. So all's well. Yeah, all well, but like Alex was – Sort of having a go, trying to race, and we spent a bit of money on him. Yeah. And but you know, like they're going to get it anyhow. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, 
Tom's had a really good life. He's yeah. been around the world five times. More he's had a fantastic he's life. Had a, and he's still having a fantastic he is. life. And, he is. You know, he's a joy. He's full-time care, but, you know, like... Um, what it's not your phone ringing, is it? Yeah, but... It's not very professional. But oh, it's, it's not very professional. I mean... It's, right. me, it's me electrician, mate. I I'll, thought it might have been your broker. It's me electrician, mate. I was <laughs> helping him out tomorrow. Yesterday, oh, right. yesterday he wants to help me out tomorrow. You he know, can wait. He can wait. You know, so don't worry about you him. See, that's a barter thing, you know. But yeah, yeah. But I'm. You got a lot of friends. I could. I can't. I can't work for anyone because I'm just unemployable. Unemployable. <laughs> I think. Um. I think a famous uh, superbike guy might have been Gyro. <laughs> Was talking to me one day about you and Andrew Johnson, and he said <laughs> we've both got uh, very good but unmarketable commodities. <laughs> and I think he was pretty right. That's euphemistic, you know. I reckon. Well, yeah. you know, like I, can't, I could never do an eight-hour day. <laughs> no, I get I'm, you. I'm, 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 I'm rooted. You could do an eight-hour race, though. I don't reckon you could work with people for eight hours because you'd have them laughing that much. They get yeah, nothing well, done. Yeah, well, that's the other problem. I like, you know, get motivation's a big issue with me these days, and. You know, like okay, well, what motivated you in uh, Superbike days? I in, in the days you're riding our bike, what I, was it? Winning. It's always been winning. I always wanted to be better than everyone else. At something without without being an asshole, without getting hurt or getting hurt. Yeah. Um, and like I don't know, it's just it's the only thing I've ever been really any good at. Like when I do a Renault, I'm as rough as guts. Gee, that's surprising. You know, like I thought it'd be absolutely oh. pinpoint perfect. No, it looks good when it's finished. Mm. If you saw what was underneath it, mm. well, um, you know the foundation. No, I think you're underselling yourself there, Rob, of, because you know, I remember like, going to New Zealand for a um, six-hour race over there with you and Cros, and uh, Macintosh was helping us, and you were riding the Kawasaki, <laughs> and uh, Macintosh, you know, had the slide rule out, and he's trying to design this stand so that when the bike came in for a pit stop. He could lift it up and change the wheels and refuel it and do all this sort of stuff. And after about two days of Macintosh with a bit of paper and a slide rule and that, Phyllis threw him out of the way, got an angle grinder, just chopped things without measuring them, welded them and made the stand. And it worked perfectly. Yeah. I'm not surprised. And Macintosh would have still been – it would have been fantastic, but two weeks later. See, that's, yeah, that's – Vernier Caliper job. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. something I can look at, like I can go and look at something and I can picture what I can yeah. make, Size it up. make with it. Or, yep. or do to it or whatever, you know, like that's yeah, that's that's okay, you know, I still like that. And well, you got an eye for it, I've got, got an eye for shit, but yeah. it comes from my father and his father, you know, like they were pretty was it good like that. You know, you're not frightened to have a go either. You oh, I'm not scared, I try to do anything, but there's some things I'm just just really good at, not not good at, oh, not <laughs> like using a mobile phone. Uh, well, I know with uh, Facebook, a computer, mate. You've done good. You've done. You've done good. You've done good. You've yeah. done very well with Facebook. Uh, I, I've enjoyed. Oh, yeah. Well, I got a six day ban at the moment. What did you do? Well, I said that. Um, I don't know. Trying to run right, to right, the right. Ukraine. Somebody, <laughs> Lou Martin, put something on. Lou well, he's Martin. got the meat for the. Lou yeah. Ma he's Lou gonna, Martin. He's going to take the boat over to no, uh, no, Ukraine. No, no, no. Lou Martin's right. Got this post up about. Like Russia, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and and um, Ukraine, Ukraine. So, and I go, what's wrong with the UN? Why don't they just blow all the Russian satellites to the shit house, yeah, right? Which yeah. which is space. So this is your, dip, your diplomacy, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. This is what I write on on the, yeah. and then point all their all their missiles that they have all around the world at each and every one of Putin and all these high ranking ranking buddy officials yeah. at their houses yeah. and then tell them what's going on yeah. and see if they pull their yeah. head in. Uh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Could work. I can't see a problem with that. No. I can't either. What's wrong with Facebook? Like, why, why, are they... why, why, why do you need to kill so many innocent people when you can just take out the arsehole? Do, you know, do you know, Robbie, there's a very strange, strong logic to what you're saying. But how, how simple is it? It's easy. Because yeah. then they'd lose all their communication. Have you rung anyone with this idea? Or? Yeah, well, like... I, I gave it to 5,000 Facebook friends, yeah, right? right. And, and they probably don't give a shit. No, but, I think but, it's... But, like... Your you thoughts, take, Mick, on you this? Take, you take out no, their satellites... I, I think the beauty the is satellites. in the simplicity. The beauty is... Right? You it's take out simple. the satellites, they've got no what communication. What possibly could go wrong? No, no, I couldn't go... I don't know how... You how pinpoint you, with a nuclear warhead 
uh, Vladimir Putin's house. Well, you don't need to do u- nuke him. Just normal. Just normal. normal. Yeah, yeah, just you don't, normal. You don't need to blow everyone else away. You only need to get just him. Just him. Yeah, like... Yeah, that's true. Probably his family probably go with it too, but, you know, like... So you're getting into an area there, yeah, right? Yep. That's, okay. That's probably not. <laughs> so diplomacy. That's not good, right? Tours, diplomacy. I didn't say anything about their families, right? Okay. No, no, no. So just, Robbie, can we get back to the knocking their houses racing? over? You know, like just blow yeah. their houses to the shit house, you know, yeah, like, yeah. And, and then let them think about it, you know, like because they got drones. Like I saw that thing on Facebook. A B fifty two had two hundred fifty thousand drones in it, and they all had faces of who they wanted to destroy. They had little um. They, you program it, and they they had these little little warheads in them that are, they could go through a, a 12, 12 inch concrete wall. There'd be like a half a dozen of these things, or three dozen of them, that go the same hole. To, so that the, the other the, the, the killing machine Mick, could make it through him. the hole, so, right? Yep, stop him, Mick. Yeah, why can't they? Why I can't can they see do why something? Facebook gave you, you the know, answer. Like, like fuck, how hard is it? Like. <laughs> Back yeah. to the su- Where's the su- hey, Back when you to need super them? bike racing. No, no, I see your point. No, no. I'm, I'm yeah, glad he doesn't drink. Can we move on? I, um, actually, I actually thought Putin wasn't a bad bloke a few years ago. Well, what made you think that? How much do you know about Putin? I don't. Right. Just, he just looked like a nice bloke. Yeah, yeah right. He always is the same. He came across well, I never well. judge a book Speaks highly of you. But I, I don't hang shit on anyone until they've done No, I know. Anymore. that's you. you know, Back to super bike racing, yeah. Mick. So, uh, Robert, well, I Well, they're not going to have it in Russia. No, there'll be no super bike racing. No, or F1. No, I know. Or tennis. Or there'll be nothing. Or anything. So, yeah. Mick, over to you. I lost um, control. Yeah, I, I think we were talking about old old times on super bikes. Yes, we were. It's probably, you know, our forte rather yes. than international. <laughs> but geopolitics. Yes, I think we're a bit, that's, we're, we're gone past that, Robert. We needed right. a drone back then, you know. Righto. Yeah. You could have yeah. watched the bike go around. Yeah, yeah. And no, then I, I could have come back and. Looked at myself and yeah, helped myself while I was watching. Could have used mobile around, phones then too; would have been good, but we didn't have them. <laughs> Over to you, Mick. Yeah. Righto. What have so, you got? Um, to? I was going to ask you, Robert. Um, as a uh, serious racer in the superbike period in Australia, who were your main um, opponents? It was basically everyone on the grid to start with. You know, like you can't underestimate. The regular good guys. And do you, you, know, do you like, think that that was a strength of the racing in that time? Was the fact like that there, there were so many guys. competitive people? There was ten guys that were could winning win. races. Yeah. You know, like and and then you go. So to, any one of ten could win. Yeah, but production was even harder. Yeah. And that's what taught us how to ride. Yep. I think production racing was definitely a good thing for judgment. Right. And judgment's what racing's all about. Everyone okay. goes, oh, you've got to have good reflexes and all this shit. You know, it's nothing to do with your reflexes. Like, everyone's got reflexes. But my reflexes are always a bit slow when I, when I, you know, when I fall off because mm. I, I didn't, didn't catch it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's your judgment that, that um, lets you know where to put the brake on, whether you're slipstreaming, whether you're not slipstreaming because it makes a hell of a difference yes. as to how you can pull the thing up. Yes. And the concentration you got to have, the feel you have through your seat of your pants, um, and the smoothness that you need to have. With you used to use that term as smooth as hessian undies. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yes, but yeah, you know, it's like a swan landing on water. Yep. You swoop into the corner, get as much roll and speed as you can you can carry, with both wheels drifting. At one one point, front and back are drifting the same, at the slowest point, and then then the back starts to hang out as you as you open the gas. Yeah, but, but I, th- I think you've made that Robbie, sound easy. I, I remember talking to um, um, when, Mick Doohan, and I, I said, Mick, you know, um, like you've won so many MotoGP or GP five hundred world titles, and I see you get off the bike and you take your helmet off, you're not even sweating. And I said, the other guys that you've just hosed, when they come in, the blokes have got to lift them off the bike and help them off with their helmets. I said, how come you're so good? And he goes, they're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> he didn't see that he was that good. Yeah. He saw that those guys, they don't train They're hard. not having enough go. They don't, they're not, they don't get on the bike prepared. He, he, he was as fit as a fiddle. And he'd yeah. get off the bike at the end, not even perspiring. Yeah. And the other guys were like basket cases. And, and he didn't see he was good. He just thought that they were 
not serious about what they're doing, not preparing themselves. No. And when what Robbie's saying now, yeah, normal people, yeah, but people that can do things really well, it's simple. I've got something here that... that um, You're not... What's his name? Put on he's Facebook. going to do his wordle. Um, You're doing your wordle. No, what's his name? Bloody Matt... Matt um, Oxley. Oxley yeah. wrote something about... I saw Matt Oxley's thing recently. Just <clears throat> yes, yesterday about how when he crashed. the best rider in the world has how's he going to make a comeback with the injuries he's got, meaning Mark Marquez, right? Yes. And how's he going to do it this year? You know, like, and I said, and I thought because I've been banned for six days, I couldn't write back to Matt. Pull your fucking head in. What about Mick doing with his legs sewn together yeah. and 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 getting on the bike and. He was wor- way yeah, worse than Marcus. Matt Oxley's just a journo, mate. What would they? You know, know? like, like I don't know, match me, mate. I Re- like reasonable racer. He's a, he's a, yeah, he did all right. He can did a bit more. When you do your yeah, own like, write-ups, you can be a champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, like he's a good bloke. You know, like no, I've look, known, I've known him forever. Well, but, a, but fucking Mick doing shits all over anybody. Like you, look, like it, yeah, the le- his leg was. He's, he was virtually, fucked. virtually needed cutting off. Didn't I know, it, really. I know, and it's, he got them both well, sewn together. What about that great story where you bent a bit of pipe and stuck it in your glove to? No, no, it wasn't pipe. Well, was I make. I, I've, like a, I've added. Was it an aluminium aluminium strap? I've done it. Like I've broken my scaphoids nine right. times each. It's a wonder they're alive, right? It's hard to ride with a right broken scaphoid. Mm. It's virtually nearly impossible, but I have. And I went to Japan to ride as well with it. But um, what I'd do, I'd get a, like, you know, a steel ruler. Mm. Well, I'd get a, a bit of aluminium strap, about the size of a steel ruler. Yeah. And I'd bend it around around my, my palm of my hand and I'd round all the corners off, wrap it in duct tape, shave my arm, elastoplaster this, this thing all the way up. Into, onto my arm, on the bottom of my arm, so it went into the palm of my hand. So when I pushed on the handlebar, it the weight was taken. The on weight the was taken on that 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 piece of aluminium yes. strap all the way up this my is arm. A world superbike level. Yeah, and Australia. That's where I learned. So you're racing superbike. with broken yeah. broken bones. Yeah. Well, you got to. What do you What do you do? You know. Yeah, that yeah. Mark is a pussy, isn't he? No, they're not pussies. No, I'm. Just, but you know, like. Well, who who was it wrote, wrote was it bloody somebody uh, uh, Huawei I think he went off and got an operation come back the next shoulder week. yeah 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 you know, like it's pretty big stuff yeah well, I couldn't afford that I didn't have any money so you just raced with the shoulder yeah yeah you know, I had to pay for it well you know, Mick, Mick said you're a wimp I am but when when that's you that's pretty tough Mick. Not, yeah but he was stopping the pain that's it's, oh he I had see. to be inventive. Yeah. To stop, the to pain, stop the pain, and then you, you know, know like it was just, okay. Yeah. I what, see. what about speaking about pain? Who? I'm talk, talking about pain, right? Was it 2008 on the old black GSX at the world at the MotoGP the support race? It's Lukey Heights. Mm. No, not Lukey Heights. The hay shed. That bloody hay shed. The hay shed. I've come through there. I'm leading. I think I was leading the race. I can't remember. But anyhow, I lost the front, right? Mm. What are you doing, under an 80k? It wasn't slow. It's a big, long crash. And the old black bike's just gone sliding across through the, the gravel with me following it forwards on my, on my guts. Mm. My hand's out in front of me, mm. like brakes. Brakes, yeah. I hit the ripple strip. What with? I hit the ripple strip with my fingertips to start with, fingertips. right? Oh. That's like hitting them with a fucking hammer on a steel Ooh, yeah. bench, right? But guess what? What else? Oh mate, oh mate, between me legs, he's, the, he's parted to the left, right? The, Mr. Pinky. And the knob, right? Oh. No, knob goes over the ripple strip, doesn't it? Jesus. So we get, we get through the gravel, and then I start cartwheeling and fill the helmet up with <laughs> those sharp stones. Put three holes in my forehead, the <laughs> blood pissing out everywhere, can't see, it's all in my face, I've got gravel in there. I shouldn't be laughing at this, should I? My fingers are killing me, so I can't, I can't touch, I can't, I can't touch my face, 
I can't pull my zip down because I think old mate's still back at the ripple strip, right? <laughs> like um, Jorge's um, finger. I'm dead set, dead <laughs> set. Like the the pain, the agony. <laughs> and the first person on the scene was the marshal and it was a girl. Female marshal, yeah. Female marshal. The marshal was a and, girl. And I'm lying around there on the ground screaming in agony and I said, please, I know... I can't, I can't undo my zip. Can you undo my zip for me? But I can't see because I've got, got blood all over my face, in my eyes. A likely story. Right. I, and I, my face is covered in blood, right, from yeah. all these fucking stones. Yeah. That they put in those stupid gravel pits that, stupid, that yeah. they shouldn't have. They should have more run well, let's right? Not, let's not bog down. So, so anyhow, I said, please, can you check old mate to see if he's still there? She said, oh, oh, oh. oh, I don't know. I said, please, I beg you because... I'm stressing big time that he's been cut off. I was serious. I wasn't joking. You know, like I, I didn't mm. give a shit who who was looking. Oh, look, I just did, wanted to know. Did she? Yeah, she did. She oh, said he's, bless he, her. he's still there. What a, I don't oh, know. I don't a, even know who this girl what was. What a delight. I have no idea who this girl was. Marriage marriage uh, material. But but anyhow. So um, our, our early days, uh, our biggest competitor was uh, Team Honda. And we were the um, David, and they were the Goliath. And our, every year, um, they were fierce competitors, really well uh, supported, um, plenty of distributor support because they were direct Honda. We were just a shop in Melbourne, in the suburb, and had a motorbike and put it together as a team. And we just had a good tight unit, and Honda had plenty of resources. And there were many times that we'd go to a, an event and they'd have two or three really good riders yeah, on really good bikes. They'd have more um, wheels and tyres. You'd see them stacked up and we'd go, look, we've got one tyre for... We've got the tyres on the bike and then another rear. That's it for the weekend. And these guys have got you know, stacks of tyres. They've got mechanics. They've got overalls. They've got tents. They've got trucks. And it just seemed that the harder they tried, the better we went. And that, that was the challenge. I mean, you know, in those days we were fierce competitors but respectful of each other. Yes. And there, was, there were several times where we'd run out of a tyre and I'd go up to Clyde and ask him, you know, Clyde, you got a spare Michelin something that we can borrow? And he'd never say no. Mm. And on the other hand, if he ever came to us and wanted to borrow something, something that Rob said quite often, he said, if, he's, if I'm not good enough to beat them, fair enough, let them win. Yep. But if I'm good enough, I'll win. And yep. the same with us. We wouldn't want to beat Honda by withholding something yep. from them. Um, it was a fair, let's get out and who the best man will win it. old that, school manners, and mate. And that's what it was like. But we loved beating them. And the harder they tried, the, the better we went. That's, was, how, that's how it was. It was like helping your, your teammate or other riders as well. You know, like you'd mm. always, if they ask me something, you know, what do you do here, what do you do there, I'd always tell them because, you mm. know, like... I only wanted to beat them, mm. and it made me feel better if I've helped them, mm. and I'm still beating them. You know, mm. like it just it was. I don't know. It's a bit so, weird, but you know. No, I get. So it. there I was totally a, a, a strong rivalry between yeah. us and Honda. Yeah, well, on the track you go flat knacker, and yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and I mean, you know, that that that's what the challenge for us was more than any other team was. But, but it hasn't. I never, I never crack it though for getting beaten fair and square. Yeah. Yeah, like that's that's life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I, I thought most. Paddocks I've seen are still a bit like that. If someone needs a bit, particularly at club I think level, motorcycle people generally are like that. Yeah, you know, um, we're all in the same boat, and no one likes very, to see someone have to go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's no. it's we all we all want to help each other yeah. in a way. Okay, yep. but you know, um, there was one year, I don't know, was it eighty three, where there was one pit facility at Bathurst, triple car garage in the middle of the pits with concrete floor, roller doors. It was about the only permanent structure in the pit. Mm. And it was um, owned by mm, HDT, who were one of our sponsors. So John Harvey, who came to the races with us, and Brock, who was a great supporter of ours and you know really helped us in a lot of different ways, um, I'd arranged with John that we have the, the garage that the facility for us. Yep. And we had a, a RG500. That was the only bike we took up there. And we had, you know... Well, Greg down. Hansford was going to ride the superbike that year. And he, he'd he um, tested, but he couldn't bend his leg. Uh, 
So, you know, we go there. Yeah. So um, John rings me up and he goes, oh, Mick, uh, I've got to ask you a question. The uh, Honda guys want to know if, if they could use the garage as well. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's a, it's a three-car garage and there's only, you know, we've only got one bike and, and you know, would you let them use the other garages? And I, and I said, well, you know, we've got more than enough room. I, you know, certainly wouldn't step in their way to do it, you know. Mm. So we get there with our, you know, one bike, spare set of wheels, some tyres, mechanic, whatever. Small team. Yeah, yeah. Dragman so, drag in his yellow leathers. Yeah. I mean, overalls. Yeah. yeah. So, and we let the Hondas, and there's um, AJ and uh, Malcolm, and they've got the RS1000 Honda Formula One bike, and they've got two VFR... 860 factory superbike things, I don't know. Three cylinder. 500. Uh, uh, AJ's 500. Oh, AJ's 500, all that stuff, right? So they got everything. We're a bit boggled. Wow, look at all this stuff. So during the event, it something happened that the Ar- we, we could have, we didn't have a bike to race in the RI 500. We didn't have a superbike there. We just had the RG 500 Grand Prix but bike. D- did we have an entry? I'm not sure. I think we had the entry for Greg. Oh, okay. Well, I anyway. I think that's what happened. So I can't remember. But there was a, a spot on the grid for us because you didn't qualify. They just gave you Yeah, a you spot. entered so you could be there. Yeah. So they, yeah. Um, I said to uh, Clyde, um, what's happening? And he said, oh, the boys, these new bikes, the 860 V4s, they're unbelievable. They've got all the trick gear on them and they just can't get enough of it. It's just such a great bike. And I said, what are you doing with the old one? He goes, oh, it's just sitting there. And I said, could you let Phyllis ride it? And he goes... Yeah, it's just sitting there. So I had to go and see um, Kip, Ron Kivovich, the Suzuki uh, mm. guy, and I said, look, um, you know, is it okay with you if Phyllis rides the Honda in the RI500? And he goes, well, have we got a bike for him to ride? And I said, no. And he said, no, I'd never stand in his way. So he, he said it's okay. Kivo, good old Kivo. Yeah. Yep, Kivo, he was a good bloke. Yeah, he was a good bloke. He was a motorcycle guy, not a not – a, he was a motorcycle guy that was working at Suzuki. A th- not, enthusiast. Not a, um, you know, administrator or whatever. No. He was a motorbike bloke. Yeah, not so a bean, He was good. He's bean still cow. riding around on his bike now. Love Kiva. Yeah, so, I do too. anyway, we, we can ride this bike. And Rick said oh – no, Clyde said, uh, okay, we'll help you in the pit stop, but, you know, you've got to run it, you've got to do this, and you can't put any stickers on it. Because it's a Honda bike. Yeah, I get that. So it was a Le Mans start. Oh, jeez. Um, so they lined up in the pit in the pit uh, pit lane, you know, in the uh, straight next to the pits. And uh, I did have a couple of quite large Mick Hone stickers that I managed to peel and stick on it once it was on the grid. Accidentally got they, it on there. And they couldn't, you know, do anything about it, right? That's I, I respect it. Okay. And these haunt the the... Four cylinder Hondas were great bikes. They were really fast. Like they were really serious super bikes. So anyway, the the race started and um I think Robbie was I'd like, never ridden it, right? Eighty one laps. Eighty one laps. So I go out and do the sighting lap. Unbelievable. And come back and then we line up, grid up. That's the first time you've seen it you've been on that bike there. That's the first time, right? So and this is the bike that both Andrew and Malcolm said, No, we don't want to ride that, it's a nail. We want to ride the new ones. Okay, mm. so I got all the levers in the right. On Honda if, I got all the levers in the right spot. You know, no, well, it's just one of those things that that what happened was um, couldn't do anything. With suspension. Settings. Robbie rode the bike. Um, the Hondas were very competitive. The other two, and I think there was somebody else. Was it Pacey or somebody that was hanging around? Yeah, at I don't the know. start uh, or some riding the Morawaki thing. Yeah, maybe. Right. So anyway, it's 81, 81 laps, mm. and there's yes. good. Lap money. So everyone is ten dollars a lap. It was everyone oh, who's in front okay. gets whoever's in front gets. $10 That's eight hundred and ten dollars. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm good with the math. I got I got the eight hundred and ten dollars. No, he didn't lead the first lap. So no, I didn't. I so got eight hundred. Like about the Soft. third about the Soft. third lap, and it's a great um, coverage on YouTube of that race because they had a helicopter. Following them across the mountain. Yeah, that's right. You know, and it was really great. I race. must have a look. Yeah, yeah, it's good and. Like Phyllis is just a, hanging around, hanging mountain, around. Cool. Then all of a sudden, um, ends up in front. And from that point, he led every every lap till the end of the race. I got to I, I got to let you know how it worked. That is, that is a quite an achievement. Well, but how did that sit with no, Honda? No, well, I, I know well, AJ had a problem where they did a pit stop or did something, and they left his valve cap off and his tire deflated. 
So he was out of the race with a flat tyre. And I don't know what happened to No, he, did, he wasn't out of the race. What happened? What happened was we started the race. I just followed him around to the first couple of laps. And Clyde said the thing revs to 10,500. Don't rev it past that. I revved it to 9,500 the whole race up until the last lap because I knew I could make it over the finish line. And if it blows up, bad luck. Yeah. yeah. I just <laughs> fucking wobble around the last turn and hope that it didn't slip underneath me, you know. But, yeah, yeah. but I grabbed it at 10 and a half on the last, down the, down the straight, see how fast it'd go. But I just rode around. I never, oh, I couldn't touch the suspension. All I could do was put the levers in the right spot. But how did you ride that bike so fast? Well, it wasn't hard because. It wasn't a bad bike. It wasn't, it was a good yeah. bike, you know. Like the boys yeah. have been riding and sort of, I didn't like it. Yeah. It was soft and soggy in the back and hard in the front and um but you know like i just learned to ride around the problem yes. if the problem was in the first three laps trying to learn how confidence in to it. get a bit of feel from it and um so i just rode around and then aj got a flat tire because the the valve cap was missing so he had to pit and they put a new new wheel in the back mm. and, uh, and he lost heaps of time um, because I was dicing with him and Wally and somebody else, I think it was Pacey or wasn't, um, um, Fiend maybe and, um, and Norris, not Norris Farrow, um, um, Roger Freeth, Roger Freeth, I no, think. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I him. Think it was but anyhow, so cruising around and then we're going up into the cutting, a fair way into the race and Wally's lost the front and went into the wall. Didn't get hurt. Thank Christ. Thank Christ. You know, like um, the cutting that, too. Christ. Yeah, up going up the hill. You know, after yeah, XL yeah. Ben, that next left hander. Yeah, you know, do. He's just trying too hard because he's trying to get in front of me. Anything could happen there. He's trying to get in front of me to pull a gap. Right. So what I do is I just follow him over the top, and then pass him at the end of the end of Conrod, and just sneak across the line in front, and then then just go up the mountain. And he had to fight to pass me somewhere to get away from me, right? And try and do it again. And try and try and get a gap on me. Yeah. But he was trying that hard into the cutting. He was in front of me and he just he was a fair way in front too. Um, because I wasn't prepared to to try too hard. You weren't prepared to die to win. Or to die to win and he lost the front. I think he might have tipped in a bit late or something like that and lost the front, you know, like and I could see that he was okay when because I was going past and he was sort of it was, yeah, it was getting good. up, sort of thing. Yeah, but well, <laughs> I wasn't that. I wasn't that far behind. He wasn't but, dead. But yeah, so um, and the race didn't get stopped, or, or you know, like it was all. So I just kept riding around. Yeah, and that was it. Yeah, and so just it was a bit of a fair nine and a half. Really. Nine it made and that half, sound easy, but nine yeah. and a half, nine and a half, nine and a half. Like it was probably the best bike in the race. Yeah. It was the fastest. Certainly looked good in the um, camera from the. Uh, I the missed a gear one. But how was that going to look if? If um, the two Honda riders don't, don't well, crash. AJ finished second, I think. And you beat him. Or third. How is that going to look for Honda? Uh, well, it was well, did it matter of, back then? It was perfect for us. Well, it was I, just another little, I get that, um, but little story in the in the story of, you know, Suzuki versus Honda yeah. in the Superbikes. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was fantastic. And I, I do remember that we used to get minimal support from Suzuki. Like, basically, we funded out of the shop. Yep. Suzuki, they did give us um, money one year, and then the next year they said, "Yeah, yeah, we'll do something." And then we'd done already done the first race at, at Simmons Plains, and I said, "Well, we need, we've already done the race. We need to know." Oh, sorry, we've got no budget. So oh, I okay. felt a bit stiffed, and you know we were committed, and we loved the Suzuki, and we loved it, but they were just smart, Alex, knowing mm. that we're going to do it whether they supported us or not. Yeah. yeah. So you know, um, they get that. Reward anyway. But yeah, and and I mean at that same stage, we had a really regular appearance on um, Sale of the Century with our bikes on a on a guest thing on a, yep. a, pro, a prize thing. I remember that. And um, Suzuki would never support us. We I did that with my own initiative. Went they in there, put the bikes there, didn't did all that stuff. Any quid? Suzuki go? Oh no, well it's not worth anything to us. And that was only prime time. Big ass. It's not worth Australia wide. Yeah. Suzuki product. Half exposure. a million people and, watching. And they go. No, it's not worth anything. And so these things I just store in my memory. Yeah. Yes. And then at the end of that year, when we did the Bathurst on the Honda, um, 
somebody had, I think Lou Martin might have taken some good shots of Robbie riding the Honda, and there was a shot of him going across the top, sort of back three-quarter view, with the bike going into the corner. Well, that's the one I got mounted and signed, thanks for all your support, you know, Suzuki Australia, cheers, you know, Mick Hone and Robbie Phillips, <laughs> right? And I gave it to the state manager and he hung it up in his office and I reckon they had no idea it was a Honda. <laughs> but I, I just yeah, well, thought, a lot you of know, peop- A lot of people that, walking into that office would have known. Well, you know, I just thought these guys, you know... <laughs> They're a long way um, from it, aren't like they? Like, we're doing it. We're busting our butts and doing it. Like, an incredible job Australia-wide. Yes. yes. And uh, Privateer, they basically. really gave us... Not that much support. Yeah. You know, we we ran um, the GSXR in 85 in the Adelaide 3 hour. It was a world. Um, I, I rode it there to run it in. <laughs> Got booked. <laughs> so that was the. Lost my license for three months. <laughs> Fair income. Fair income. <laughs> so that, that was the first event for that model worldwide. Uh, Horsham. Okay, bloody 180 k. I'd just been doing 240, <laughs> running it in. They rode it down. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it won, the, <laughs> won the race. So that was in March '82. Oh, no, March '85, '85, because I wasn't there. I was at the um, attending the, the birth at, of my daughter Catherine. Yes. So I had to ring them up from the phone in the hospital to see what's going on. And Alan was there with Dragman and Robbie, and and it was like a fairy tale. There, they won. It was good. And, you know, we had a spare wheel out of the bike from the motor show because that bike was from the motor show, but there was another one and, and we needed a rear wheel, but we didn't have a sprocket carrier. So, <laughs> so um, Alan and Drags were doing the wheel, had to take the sprocket carrier yeah. off the wheel that come out of the bike and put it in the new wheel. New wheel. Then put it in and it was a quick pit stop. Yeah. <laughs> It worked good. Jeez. Right. I don't and think I lost a spot. Okay. And we, we, we won that race. Okay? Yeah. We won that race. Yeah. Uh, Suzuki, the, the, the bike was supplied by uh, Cornell Suzuki, who were the South Australian distributor, and they employed us to run it as we were a leading team, right? So we won that race in Adelaide. I got a two-line telegram from Suzuki. Uh, congratulations on the result, you know, whatever. That was it. Nothing else. Mm. No support, nothing. Mm. And they said, oh, what a bit of a failed. You could have, you know, torpedoed the whole campaign on that bike. And, and in a way, I can see that. Yeah, but it didn't. But it didn't, right? <laughs> and, and it was a world debut win. And I if- saw a Japanese magazine that had four pages about that race and Phyllis um, yeah. exposure and mm. Suzuki Australia didn't even talk about it. So that was a they funny missed relationship. The boat. So missed the boat. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure, Greg. The Thank life, you so much. Life and times of Robert Phyllis. Mate, Robbie, we finished? Robbie, no, that's I'm, enough. I'm not finished. Oh, no, you're finished. I'm just getting wound Thank up. Thank you very much for being with us. Okay. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. could go for hours, mate, and we probably will when we hang it up, but we're about to run out of tape. No, I don't want to give up. Thank you, brother. No worries. Thanks, thank mate. Thank you, Michael. Thank I, you, Greg. And thank and, you uh, for all you've done to help my racing career as well, mate. My pleasure. In my later years on... on um, Classic superbike. It was my pleasure, and uh, if I can do it again, I will. Thank you so much. It's it's horn. <laughs>